Please be seated. Metropolitan is um, come all the way from Greece, like I mentioned. Um, can you, Grace, maybe you can just, if you like, give us a bit of introduction on yourself and maybe how you come to the, to the church. Skip the. Oh, you're eminent. Sorry, I'm still I'm still learning the church in those. You mix the titles. Sorry, sorry. It's okay. Well, I'm really glad that I'm here. Uh, as we were told, I come from Greece. Please feel free to laugh at my English whenever I make a mistake. Uh, it's okay, I laugh at your Greek when you make a mistake. <laughs> so, in any case, it's mutual. So, now we are here, and uh, we have a topic, huh? What was the topic? Are you there? Are you there? What does that mean? <laughs> So you'll understand what it means at the end. But till the end, I don't know if you like in any case. So what is this, do you know? What is this? The Bible, yeah. What is the Bible? Hmm? Yep. God's word. What? God's word. God's word. Hmm. Are you sure about that? Because Jesus wrote nothing. You know that Jesus wrote nothing. So, what's the deal? Story. Story. Science fiction? No. <laughs> history? Beyond. Beyond that. Beyond history. Well, not all the books are about history. And not all the books tell a story. We have books that say incomprehensible things. But in any case, we'll see later. So what's this book? What's what's a Bible? How, well, how do you feel towards this book? What do you think of this? What does it stand for? You're not Protestants. Is there any, anyone who's Protestant among us? No, no, no problem. Why are you laughing, Clappers? You always protest, but this doesn't mean you're a Protestant. Well, since no one seems to have an answer, I have to tell you that this book is the most dangerous book ever communicated on Earth. The most dangerous. The greatest crimes uh, were, let's say, based upon the verses of this book. Many people died because of this book. And uh, to some extent, much of the evil of this world is due to this book. You will astonished. Well, don't forget that all the heresies, all the schismas, are based upon verses of this book. So, we have people that read this book and uh, understand different things than, than other people. And that due to their understanding, they start whatever they believe as their own truth or the, the, the objective truth. And uh, based upon that truth, they create a problem to the whole world. Bear in mind that when the whole exposition started uh, its own work, uh, it was based upon certain verses of the New Testament. They burned people because of certain verses of the New Testament. So this book has a double reading. You can either be holy or you can be evil. You can either know Jesus and his word and his will, or you can misinterpret it and uh, be guided completely wrongly. What's the, well, let's say, what's the difference? What is that that differentiates evil from good or 
uh, what can make us feel sure of what, what we read and understand. Our fellow and misguided brothers, the Protestants, have a principle. Perhaps you have learned it, uh, well, all of you that uh, have gone to the theological faculty. You have learned that the Protestants believe in sola scriptura, so only the text of, the, of this book. They read it, they understand whatever they understand, and they interpret it. They interpret it differently, that's why we have uh, so many sects in the Protestant world. But this has to be wrong, since Christ himself spoke about one church, and he prayed for the only and one church. There cannot be this differentiation. Well, whatever happens to the Christian world nowadays cannot be accepted, is not to be uh, excused. Someone has somewhere made a mistake, and we have to find out where is that mistake in order to understand what is the true meaning of this book and to what type of faith Christ really calls us. So, we have this book. I told you it's the most dangerous. It's the most dangerous book upon the earth. If you read it, you're not allowed to read it. Don't look at me like that. This book has to be studied. There is a strong difference between reading and study. Read well by reading newspaper. If you start reading this book like a newspaper, yes, you'll make uh, false uh, deductions and uh, you lead yourself to great mistakes, to the false faith. If you study this, meaning that you prepare yourself in order to open this book and study, meaning that you don't uh, rely upon yourself and uh, your ideas in order to, to understand or interpret this book, <coughs> then you are in a good way. The Earth of Church is uh, a little bit, well, let's say, the Earth of Church is very precocious with this book. The Earth of Church has its own arguments to, to offer towards our brothers, the Protestants, whenever they speak about Sola Scriptura on this book. And the first question that it's always uh, made is, who wrote this book? Well, you know that God, uh, the, the gospel, the gospels, there are four gospels, were written by the four evangelists, as we call them. So, Matthew, Lucas, Mark, and John. Then we have uh, the Praxis, the Acts of the Apostles, written by Lucas. And then we have uh, the 14 letters of Paul to several churches. And then we have the seven general uh, letters by several apostles, and then we have the Apocalypse. All of these books were written by certain person, certain persons. We know who wrote them. Who decided that these books are to be holy and uh, for the canon of the, the New Testament? Because if you go back especially in the second century, you'll find other books that are named after apostles. We have the Gospel of uh, Thomas, we have the Gospel of uh, Judas, we have the Gospel of uh, Mary the Magdalene, we have the Gospel of, well, many Gospels. Who decided that not all Gospels, but only those, these four are to be part of the canon, as we say, of the New Testament? Do you know who formed this book? Who decided what to put in and what to exclude? We have three councils. We have the Council of Laodicea, the Council of Rome, and then the Council of Carthago, Perchidona. These three councils, in the early centuries of the Christian Church, discussed the matter of uh, what is genuine and what is false. Because we had certain Christians that uh, wanted to write something about Christ, but they were unknown. So their text, they gave their text to the church under the name of some apostle in order to to have a certain, uh, well, let's say, a certain esteem. Not all these texts are true. Some of these texts that are written in the second century, not in the first, contain uh, historical facts. We use some of these texts, not as gospels, but as uh, texts that uh, can help us with the early Christian history. 
we have certain feasts in our calendar that uh, do not appear in the gospel, in the gospels, the four gospels, but nevertheless, we celebrate them, like the, sorry, the entrance, yes, of Mary, the, the, the church of Solomon, to the temple of the Solomon. The entrance is described nowhere in the four gospels. It is described in another text that uh, was written in the second century, the gospel of Thomas. It is not a gospel, it was not written by Thomas, but uh, nevertheless it handed down a tradition, a historical tradition of the early church, and that's how we form this celebration, this feast. The church had to be very precautious about what to accept as original text and uh, as something that might be a product of piousness, but was not written by an apostle or, or was not uh, really accepted by the early church. Since the second century, we had the, the first heretics, uh, we had the movement of Gnosticism. You know what Gnosticism is? Uh, it's a mixed uh, philosophical uh, movement, mixed with religion, I, I mean. And uh, they tried to uh, explain Christianity, not as uh, Jesus described Christianity itself and according to the tradition that was handed over by Christ himself. They wanted to mix in uh, philosophical elements from Plato, and uh, that was really sad because uh, they formed uh, ideas that uh, didn't derive from the mouth of Christ, but uh, from uh, a human effort to create something different uh, from the church. So we have texts that were written in the second century. They spoke about Christ, but uh, they are not Christian texts. And the church had to protect itself from those texts that uh, didn't hunt any of the truth, but hunt ideas that, well, they might appear to be nice, but were not the, the original uh, sermon of uh, Christ himself. So we have a series of texts that were excluded, that were characterized as apocrypha. Apocrypha, in Greek, it means uh, really secret, very secret doesn't mean that they are secret. These texts were not destroyed or they were not condemned. They were kept in the monasteries and uh, there are libraries at the, at the 20 mountains, at the 20 sorry, uh, monasteries of Holy Mountain. We have uh, several uh, copies of these uh, books. Every now and then some English author uh, claims that he has discovered uh, a new gospel. Well, he most probably learned about something that has been kept uh, in one such library for many centuries, and uh, it was a true level revelation for him to, to find out that there are other texts than the four gospels. So he claims that he has found something that we the Greeks at least know the about, about uh, the existence of uh, such texts uh, ever since they started uh, to be handed down in the writing form. For us, whenever we hear that someone uh, found out about some gospel, it's not a revelation, it's a matter to laugh at. Because it's not something new. All the apocrypha, all the secret uh, gospels are uh, published in Greek and they circulate in Greece. If you want, you can find them in every religious bookstore. But of course, under the description that they are not the gospels of the canon of the Holy Scripture, of the, the New Testament, but there are texts of the second century, of the third century, that were handed over, and uh, many times, these texts uh, were written not by pious Christians of the early centuries, but by heretics or by Christians that misunderstood the meaning of the gospel. So, since the very beginning, we had to be careful with what derived from the apostles and what was uh, something that other people, well, created in order to be let's say modern, because in the first and the second century, after Christ, after Christ yes, it was something, uh, well, modern to be Christian. As you have fashion in the clothes, sometimes you have fashion in the ideas. For example, nowadays, agnosticism is in fashion. Uh, the usual answer, uh, what do you believe about that is, I don't know, or I don't care, which is worse. In any case, there were, there was a time that Christianity was in fashion. 
So many people, not even Christians, wanted to speak about Christianity. That's why they created the first text in the first centuries. And that was really dangerous because the church always accepted the, the texts that were read, that were written by the apostles and had certain meaning and had a certain message to the world. According to the Orthodox Church, the Bible, both the Old and New Testament, are not to be stand alone. They stand in accordance to our current tradition. We say that the, the, body, the human body needs to stand upon its two feet. So we have two feet as well. The Holy Scripture and the Holy Tradition. You cannot have only one. You have to have two in order to understand the meaning of this book. So whenever there was a question or there was a, a matter that appeared, we usually asked for the fathers to interpret what was the real meaning. This book can be interpreted in various forms, but only one is the genuine one. But only one is according to the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit, as we say. That's why in the Orthodox Church, we hold precious the fathers of our church, the great fathers that interpreted that text and gave us the true meaning, as we say. We cannot deviate from that meaning. We cannot say that uh, certain things in this book mean other than, they are, uh, than our fathers have decided. It's dangerous. All over the centuries, we have many heresies and many heretics that claim that they have the truth. And they all base themselves on verses of this book. Please remember that even our Lord Christ, after his 40 days in the desert, he faced three temptations. You remember that? You remember the three temptations of, the three temptations of Christ? No answer? Well, I see some hands bowing, but do the majority of you understand what I'm talking about? When Christ uh, was baptized, immediately after that, he left uh, the area of Jordan River and went to the desert, where he stayed for 40 days, passing and praying. Then he returned, and uh, on his return, he had uh, a fight with the devil, let's say. So he had to face three temptations. In all three temptations, the devil attacks Jesus with verses from the Old Testament. Sometimes in the Orthodox Church, in form of the joke, we say that the best theologian is the devil himself. He knows everything and by heart. And he can face everyone of us uh, through this book. Sometimes we say that this book can be uh, the devil's weapon. He fought against Jesus with verses from the Old Testament. And of course, Jesus replied with verses of the Old Testament and interpreted them correctly. But this has to, to show to us that it's really easy to pick up verses from this book and create something dangerous and create something that has nothing to do with love and peace that Christ wanted to bring to this world. But you can make several evil things based upon this book if you interpret it wrongly. And that's why the Orthodox Church uh, held of great esteem people that could uh, not only understand but interpret this book correctly to the others. In the early times, the Orthodox Church has a, a special team that uh, they will call the catechites, uh, meaning with the catechesis, the people who were responsible for the catechesis of all the others. Only them could teach the people uh, about the teachings of this book. They, well, they, they were not only educated, but the church relied upon them mostly due to their lives, the way of their lives, and uh, mostly due to uh, the way that could interpret this book. Not anyone can speak about this book. That's why in the 15th century, after the Turkish occupation, after the fall of Constantinople, when uh, not that many people uh, were literate and not that many people could interpret correctly this book, there was an, an encyclium, so a decision of the Council of Constantinople, that uh, ordered that this book should be placed high in the houses among with the icons. Every Orthodox house has icons. You know that. You have icons in your house as well. 
And usually these icons are somewhere in a high place. They are hung on the walls or in a closet. In front of them, usually, uh, we burn a candle. Now, the, side, the, the council said that this book had to be put among the icons high in the, play, in the houses, so as the people not to be able to read it. Why? Because if the people tried to read this book without anyone to help them to interpret them, to interpret it, to, to understand exactly what it is all this about, then mistakes would be made and uh, people who would be led to the false of faith. From this position, high among the icons, the Holy Testament, the New Testament, uh, was again put in the hands of the faithful only in the early 20th century when a bunch of theologians decided to cope themselves with uh, interpreting the book and make a secular, uh, sorry, uh, lady sermons, by lady I mean, uh, not that uh, but not of high level, but uh, simple, as simple as uh, anyone can understand, so that the majority would again be familiar with the texts. During the Turkish occupation among the Orthodox, we had missions from the Protestants, and the Protestants held this book in, uh, in their hands, and they tried to convince the, the Orthodox that they were in false way, in, in false path, uh, taking examples from, the, from certain verses uh, of this book, if you open the New Testament, you can even find in it that there is no God. There is a verse that says so, there is no God. But before that, there is another verse that says, the idiot said to himself. So, if you start and cut the verses into pieces, you can take whatever meaning you want. But the important thing is not to take the meaning that you want. The important thing is to accept the message that Christ wants to give to his people, to his world, through this book. That's why the Orthodox Church has a great esteem for our holy tradition. That's why the Orthodox Church says that you cannot read this book alone. You have to have the, the Bible studies, but not in the way the Protestants have, where they read something and then anyone can decide, can say his own opinion. You cannot say your own opinion about this book. You are to follow this book, so you have to understand that you are a student and you have to learn from this book. You cannot express your opinion about this book. You may ask questions, we even may disagree. But then you have to make your opinion in such a way that your goodwill is to be proven and uh, in order to find more truth, this book does not prohibit uh, the study. Actually, it is written that you have, you have to try hard to find the truth. It is one of our tasks. And whenever we have doubts, the doubts is something nice in the Orthodox Church. Remember the Sunday of Thomas, the next Sunday after Easter. On, on Easter Sunday, we have the, the Vespers of Love. You have it? The Vespers of Love. And then we read the Gospel there that describes the first appearance of our Lord to his disciples. They were afraid, they were all locked in, and Thomas was not among them. The Gospel of the most sent day, of the, the most important feast of our faith, ends with these words, I don't believe, I won't believe. It's what Thomas said to the apostles when they told him that we saw the Lord. And uh, Thomas then started saying, unless I put my hand upon the nails, upon the mark of the nails of his hands, unless I put my hand on his side, on the mark of the spear, I will not believe. The gospel of our most holy and most precious feast ends with the words, I won't believe. And this remains in our ears for a week. This gospel is again read on uh, Sunday morning, the next Sunday mor uh, morning, and uh, then we read the continuity of it, the, what's, what stands next in the, in, the test, in the text. And then we have the, acknowledge, the acknowledgement by Thomas that Jesus has resurrected and uh, that he was uh, not as a spirit, but as a body, he was resurrected and stood in front of him. That's the most important. But for a week, 
church allows us to have this in our ears. I won't believe. The church doesn't want to force us to believe. The church wants us to try to find faith. To try to find faith, not in a way of studying and reading books. You won't find faith in the books. Our faith is not something that has to do with uh, comprehension. God is so great that cannot be comprehended. It's impossible to comprehend, to understand God. It's something many times superior to me, high above me. I cannot understand him. Well, there, is a, there was a, a, a certain night in the, the life of St. Augustine. He walked at the beach of uh, North Africa where he lived, and he was thinking, how will I be able to understand God? And then he saw a, bit, a small child that has dug something there in the, the sand, and uh, with a small bucket, he was carrying water and then dipped in, his, uh, in what he had dug there. And St. Augustine asked him, what are you doing there? And the small kid answered, well, I'm trying to empty the sea in this big hole. And uh, St. Augustine laughed and said, well, can't you understand that that's impossible? And the kid answered to him, if the sea that has limits cannot be emptied in this big hole, then how do you want to understand God with your small, tiny mind? The God that has no limits. It was the best, the best answer that he received. God cannot be comprehended, but God can be experienced. The saints have an experience of God. And the saints prove us that uh, God is someone with whom we can develop a relationship. And that's the spiritual life for. We have to develop a relationship with God. But in order to, to come nearer to God, we have to use this book, but not in the wrong way. The most important thing is to read correctly this book. That's why the church always had a, a, a very careful way to approach this book. Not only the two councils, but the first ecumenical council as well decided which book was genuine and was to be put in this canon. So we have texts that were written in the first centuries, but were not written by apostles, and they were excluded. We have texts that uh, they were uh, acknowledged as uh, true texts written by apostles. But even these texts that are in the canon of the New, New Testament are not to be read in a free way. They are to be interpreted according to what our fathers have handed us down. According to the spirit that was given by Christ, the way that he talked to, the, to at his age, with all this, the spirit of the word of Jesus was handed over to us by the apostolic fathers and then by the fathers of the church. That's why in our church the fathers play a special role. The great sense that gave us interpretation of this book. Sometimes the interpretation of the fathers that we hold, that we know, that we have, were not handed down, were not written by them. For example, most sermons about this book belong to St. John the Chrysostom. St. John the Chrysostom, apart from some epistles, some letters, didn't write anything else. The sermons, his sermons, were written down by uh, civil servants by the clerks of the palace that used to come to his sermons and write down everything because uh, the palace suspected him that was plotting against uh, the emperor's Eudoxia. So he was not in uh, good uh, was not in good manners with the palace. So the public servants wrote down all his sermons in order to find something foul, to find something uh, wrong against the palace. He was three times. Uh, sentenced to exile, and uh, at all these three times, uh, parts of his sermons were the reason why St. John the Chrysostom was in exile. But in any case, this was a real, ble a real blessing to the church because all the sermons of St. John the Chrysostom were handed down, were written, and were written in a correct form because the, the clerks of the palace 
were the most stable ones. You cannot dispute their uh, punctuality. The, the, they, they wrote down whatever they heard. That's why we have uh, the full version of the sermons of St. John the Chrysostom, despite the fact that St. John the Chrysostom didn't want uh, his sermons to be written down, and despite the fact that what was written down was used against him. So we have uh, such facts that enable us to claim that our father's ideas about the interpretation of the, this, this book uh, are genuine, are handed down correctly, because they were not written down even by them, but by their enemies. And the church accepted what was written because it was genuine, it was what the, the believers, the, the faithful, heard, and uh, what the first church understood as the real truth. So now, in order to give an example, we can uh, try to understand something from this book, right? Who has been here for the first time today? Who was the first person that showed up here today? Not who showed up. <laughs> who has come here for the first time? No, Who's never been before here? Okay, come here. Come here. Just come. Come here. Just stand up and come here. <laughs> Not from the Old Testament, but from yeah, from this part of the world. Take a text. Just open up the Yes. Open up wherever you wish. All right. Give this to Left way to right. they spoke to the people, meaning uh, Peter and John, the priests, the captain of the temple, and uh, the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead, and they laid heads on them and put them in custody and then, until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. So, after the Pentecost, the Apostle started preaching in Jerusalem. This was quite annoying for uh, the Sadducees and with the, the, the priests of the temple, and they tried to stop the sermon. In one occasion, they, they succeeded in arresting Peter and John. So, this part of this arrest is described, but in such a way that you have to gain something from that. This book doesn't contain history. It contains teaching. So unless you have to learn something, it is not written down in here. You have always to find out what the author of a verse has to offer or what he is tempted to say. As they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. So there was a public uh, gathering and uh, there appeared the priest of the church of the, the temple of Solomon, the captain of the temple. So the temple had his own guards, its own guards. Why a temple is in need of guards? Do you have guards in the parishes here? I don't mean Lambert. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have guards here in the churches, in the parishes? No. Yeah, I know that you're strong enough, but well, when usually something is about to happen, the strong enough are the first to disappear. <laughs> now, why the Temple of Solomon was a of guards? Why a religious place, place is in need of guards? Have you ever thought about that? In Jerusalem, well, nowadays, 
every religious place has a, has a Israeli, Israeli police uh, outside. Uh, well, due to the fact that sometimes <laughs> several things happen, well, it's the, 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 the city of peace is the city that you cannot find peace, uh, not in every corner of, the, of that city. It's the, the city of, of everyday violence and uh, disputes. But in any case, in Jerusalem, you can understand the need of the police outside every sacred, uh, sacred uh, every, outside every church or every mosque or even the place where the Jews call them for their the wall of the tears. Not, not the synagogues. I mean the wall of the tears, the, the, the place where they say that it's the last remnant of the Temple of Solomon. But at those times, why they needed guards and there wasn't the captain of the temple? Nowadays, Vatican still uh, has its own guard, the Swiss guard. And we have captains of the, this guard. And uh, these are, as we call them, the, the Pope's own. So uh, they stay there for the safety of the Pope. Is that so common among us? Why don't we have guards? Well, I came on alone. The Father Ignatius cannot be uh, uh, sta cannot stand as my guard. No. <laughs> Sorry, I came here alone. Why don't I have guards? And why the Temple of Solomon had guards? Can you understand why? Has it ever occurred to you as a thought why a holy place needs to be guarded? Of course, nowadays you could answer to me that there are people that cannot stand uh, the idea of uh, holy or, or cannot uh, have respect for the faith of someone else and they might create problems. Yes, exactly. We have uh, such violations in Greece, all over Europe, all over the world. But does this give us a reason to have guards in the churches. And if you have guards, then how can you rely upon your faith that God is your protector? You see, the Jews were contradicted to that. They believed that God was their protector, and at the same time, they had guards at their temple. And it was uh, uh, a term of their surrender to the Romans, that they would be able to hold a guard at the temple. This guard, these soldiers, were never used uh, in uprisings against the Romans by the Jews. This guard always stood there for the temple and was used sometimes alongside with uh, the Roman legions. It was uh, a power of suppression. And this guard well, this guard had nothing to do with the temple as such. Mostly they guarded uh, the treasures of the temple. And uh, sometimes they, gu uh, they guarded, well, the safe entrance for some important people that uh, the simple people seem to hate. King Herod, Herod the Great, his father and King Herod, were among the uh, the persons that the Jews never liked. And whenever they saw them, well, they were eager to throw a stone or to, to call them some names. So uh, they had to be guarded. And this uh, guard of the temple, the soldiers of the temple, were there not for God's sake, for, uh, well, let's say, for the need of the temple itself, but they were there in order to to protect certain people that uh, wanted to, to force their power upon the temple and upon the, let's say, the goodwill or the, the tradition of the people. So this guard comes to arrest Peter and John. What we understand by the way that they were arrested is that the apostles didn't have anything to, to fight against the people. But the means of the power of those days, the guards, the principles of the, the Jewish people, uh, the elders, 
were against them. And then there, there, there is this question. Why the elders of Israel? Why the Jews? Why people that uh, were raised reading the prophecies and uh, all of these texts that spoke about the Messiah? Why were against Christ at the beginning and then against his disciples? Do you know why they fought against Christ? Have you ever understood why they started all of these things that ended up with the crucifixion of Christ? Why was Christ crucified? What was Christ charged for? Why did they crucify him? Yep. Because he said he was the Messiah. Meaning what? That he was like the truth, like he was the Jesus. In the gospel, we read the exact reason why the Jews were so against uh, Christ. Because he claimed that he was the Son of God. He claimed that he was the Son of God. That was the only and true category accusation. And he was uh, then transferred to Pontius Pilatus, the, ruler, the Roman ruler of Judea, because the Jews couldn't, apl uh, couldn't apply the death penalty by themselves. They had to hand over uh, the people that were to be that they were to be executed to the Roman uh, ruler. And uh, the accusation there deviated was different a little bit. They told to the Roman ruler that Christ claimed himself as a king. So he was about to start a rebellion. The accusation was that Christ claimed to be the Son of God, not the Messiah, because the Messiah, according to the, the Jewish interpretation, was the, the person who would come and uh, free them from uh, the Romans. The Jews had passed such hard times that they couldn't accept anything else as a true interpretation of the prophecies, but only that there would come someone who would free them, free them from the Roman uh, suppression. They had harsh times for many centuries under the Persians, under the Egyptians. When uh, Alexander the Great uh, conquered uh, Palestine, he applied certain freedom to the Jews, and that's why they accepted him as uh, someone that, uh, that his coming was uh, forespoken in the Bible. But then the Hellenic kingdoms and the successors, the successors of Alexander the Great were really mean with the Jews. They suppressed them as well. And then the Roman conqueror came, and that was the end. It was total suppression. So the Jews didn't have in their mind anything else but their secular freedom. And they wanted to build back again the state of David, a powerful state in the Eastern Mediterranean. Or even better, a state that could uh, succeed Rome and be the most uh, powerful state in the known world. So the word, the word Messiah for the Jews meant someone who would come with uh, secular power, not with spiritual power. Someone who would come and free them from their slavery. That's why Christ never claimed to be the Messiah, never used the word Messiah. Nowhere in the gospel you read uh, that uh, Christ said that I'm the Messiah. No. This is a false word. And uh, our fathers don't use it, uh, the interpretation of, the, of this text. Our fathers never called Jesus the Messiah. Only in these uh, times that they want to prove to the Jews that uh, he's the one that they have been waiting for for, those, for many centuries. Our fathers speak about the Son of God and the Son of the Man, as Jesus sometimes uh, spoke about himself. 
He said the time of the, the son of the man. The son of the man because he was a perfect human and the son of God because he was perfect God. So they come and arrest his disciples because they spoke about someone who said that I'm the son of God and who the apostles claimed that he was resurrected. Can you tell me who was the first one to learn about Christ's resurrection? Who heard first, first of all, about Christ's resurrection? Who? 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 The women? No, that was several hours after. Who was the first to learn about Christ's resurrection? <laughs> So who? What card? No. Uh, Mary the Magdalene and, and mistakenly thought that uh, Jesus was the gardener. But the gardener was Jesus himself. And that was something that happened uh, perhaps eight or ten hours after the resurrection. What? The guards. Did they saw Christ rising? Did they see Christ rising? What the guards? What did the guards see? Aha! Uh -huh. So resurrection, the most important part of our faith, and no answers. Hmm. You're Orthodox, eh? <laughs> now, who was the first to learn about resurrection and believe the whole resurrection study case? Who was the first to learn and accept the resurrection? Yep. Who? Well, Peter ran to the tomb in order to verify that Christ was resurrected. So he didn't believe in the beginning. He had to go there and see. But that was a little bit after. Who was the first? Was it Mary Magdalene? A little bit louder? Was it Mary Magdalene? No, I, I told you already that she learned about that or eight to ten hours. Or perhaps his mother, the Virgin Mary? Well, from the people that love Christ, yes, his mother, Mary, was the first to learn about the resurrection. But she was not the very first to learn about the resurrection and accept it. Yep, who? Was it a thief? Who? The thief? The thief was dead then, very dead. You know, the thief. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't see the dead. Sorry. Yep. Who? <laughs> well, Christ learned everything about the resurrection. But no. I mean about the, the other fellows. Who was the first who learned about the resurrection and accepted? Yep. Lambros? <laughs> I speak about humans. Yes. No, that was two days after. Thomas? What? That was a week after. Okay. Who? Yep. Louder. Again? No, no. That was in the other world. I speak about this earth. Who were the first that learned about Christ's resurrection and accepted? It as, uh, as something true. Ah. Yes? No, it was hard for them to, for, for it, even, even the, the resurrection, even for the disciples, was hard to, to, to accept. I think we'll be here all night. Yeah. Sorry? We'll be here all night. Yeah. No one? The first one that learned about Christ's resurrection and accepted it as such were the persons that led Christ to be crucified. The second verse of the temple and uh, how do you call the Pharisees? Pharisees? Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were gathered and then the soldiers appeared in front of them and uh, they told them, well, he's resurrected. And they don't tell to the, to the soldiers, what are you talking about? What is this rubbish? 
they accept it completely and they try to fight to fight against that. And they tell the soldiers, look, take money and say that we were asleep and his disciples came and stole his body from us. The first that learned about the resurrection and accepted it as a fact were the people that crucified Christ. You have to, to understand this well in order to understand why, despite the fact that the church has the truth, this truth is not solemnly accepted by the whole world and does not rule this world. The people, well, not all the people, but many people, have such great part of heaven in their hearts that, you know, that the, they fight against the truth even, they, even when they accept it. The people that crucified Christ accepted the resurrection. They were the first. They were even the ones that feared most the resurrection. That's why they asked from uh, the Roman ruler to set the guard, to set the guards around the tomb and uh, to close the tomb really harsh. They put wax around the stone in order no oxygen to be in there. And they took every precaution, all the measures that were needed in order to, to be certain that no one would come out from the stone. Despite all this, when the guards come to them and tell them that, well, he resurrected. They don't deny the resurrection. They accept it. And they fight against it. You'll, you'll meet many people in your lives that even when they see the truth, they don't want to accept it and comply to the truth, but they want to fight against the truth. And that's something that sometimes characterizes ourselves. Sometimes truth is something that is not easy for us. And due to this fact, we try to fight against the truth. So the people that crucified Christ acknowledged his resurrection and were the first to fight him. So Christ allowed his resurrection to be learned by those people who were to fight against his resurrection. And uh, through these 40 days that appeared to his disciples and to other people, the ones that belonged to him, the ones that loved him, the ones that were his followers, let's say, the disciples and all the rest, were really dubious, full of doubt. They couldn't accept what they were seeing. Please be careful and watch this. The enemies of Christ accepted the resurrection with no second word. The disciples had to try hard to accept the resurrection. And then they were sent to preach this, this resurrection over the world. And uh, one of the heaviest duties of the church is to preach about this resurrection all over the world based upon the sermons of these apostles that couldn't even themselves accept this resurrection in, in, in the, at the, the early stage. So now we have Peter and John that were arrested while they were preaching about the resurrection. And the guards of the temple come to arrest them not because they preached something false, they preached something that was a lie, but because what they preached was against the will of their masters. The, the heaviest task of the church is to comply with historical events, with historical standards, with social standards. Sometimes the society wants to follow other paths. The church accepts that, accepts that. But at the same time, the church does not accept the effort that is made. Uh, the faith to be proven as not non-existent, or the faith to be proved wrong, or the morality, or the ethics, or the, the church to be proved wrong. So, what we read in these verses is the effort of well, let's say the power of those times to shut the disciples up 
and to force them not to preach about the resurrection, about the fact that the masters of the soldiers had already accepted. Can you understand the contradiction? They acknowledged the resurrection, they not even for a moment disputed it, and they started fighting against it from the very beginning. So now, the priests of the temple and the guards of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, Peter and John, that were preaching in public. These verses, when they are thoroughly examined, uh, sometimes form the basis upon which we speak about the relations of the church and the state. The relations of the church to human power. Sometimes uh, we say that uh, orthodoxy is the best form of anarchy. Well, we are anarchists, not only because we wear black and we have a hair and beard. The traditional description of the anarchists, eh? but because we believe uh, to the anarchos, anarchos is a Greek, word, a Greek word meaning without beginning or without uh, someone who can rule us. Uh, anarchos is one of the identities of God. He knows no beginning. He has no beginning in time. God cannot be defined by human limits, by human uh, measures. So he's anarchos. And anarchia is a word that derives from this uh, subject and means, uh, well, disputing every form of uh, authority. We do that in the church sometimes. Well, when uh, Peter and John were arrested, they were guided in front of the great council to to apologize, as they were forced to do. And then Peter says a word, says a phrase, that ever since has remained in the Orthodox Church, and this is the limit that gives us uh, the excuse sometimes to stand up against uh, the laws against fatal decisions. There, Peter says at the beginning, if we shut up, the stones will cry. And then he says something else, we have to, we are obliged to obey to God and not to human beings. So, we can obey to whatever is useful for the organization of the society. In fact, Christians are the best subjects in every state because uh, they don't have any problem to obey the human law. But, at the same time, uh, they are eager not to follow everything of the human law whenever this is against God's will. God's will, as, the, as it's described in this book. So that's why we have many conflicts, especially in Greece, with the state. Many times the church has, stand up, has stood up and said, no, you cannot promulgate such laws, or you cannot uh, say such things in public. Not in order to suppress the state authority and uh, make them follow the church. We are not uh, Catholics. We don't want the authority, the power to follow the church. We want a Christian society, not a Christian state. The, the, the power of the authority is something that sometimes is not good, has nothing to do with the church as such. We're a little bit anarchists because we don't like to cope ourse ourselves with secular matters, with matters of the state. We think that by running a state is something really, <coughs> really dangerous for our soul. How come that someone wants to rule the others, even in democratic, uh, uh, in democratic uh, states? How come that someone wants to be uh, the one who will tell to the others what to do? That's God's privilege. So, how come that someone can be a Christian ruler? That's another problem in our church. We have Christian rulers. We had uh, emperors in the Byzantine time that uh, appeared as emperors on the outside, and in their own room they slept on the floor, they, they prayed a lot, and they were eager 
to find what God wanted from them. On the other hand, we have uh, rulers of this world that try to make their own decisions and uh, to make people follow them uh, in a hard manner. We have rulers that uh, acknowledge them themselves. And that's something really evil. In any case, in the Orthodox Church, we have standards about uh, our relationship with the state and uh, how can someone become a Christian ruler to what extent. In any case, we, we feel ourselves a little bit as anarchists. And we have, you have to accept that. We were a little bit, now, not rebels, but in any case, we ask questions. We don't follow. We always uh, ask questions and uh, have something else to say. Why that and not that? That's why the Orthodox Church was always uh, was always regarded by rulers of this world as, as something uh, hostile. Right? We are not hostile to the state. We are friendly to, to God, so we want God's will. To, to be the, the first law for where the law derives. Who says, uh, who, who can say to us if a law is good or not? If uh, a party has a majority in the parliament, that means that whatever is voted is good enough for us. And, uh, well, there are laws that were promulgated and then they were removed. They were taken back. All this makes us, uh, well, makes us have the, the, the idea of not relying completely upon the state. We have our own way of thinking, and that's why we define life and everyday life and uh, the amount of time that is to be given to us. We don't know how many years we live. Well, we seem to define this life. In accord, according to this book and the way that the Orthodox Church interpreted, interprets it, and not according to whatever the rulers of this world or uh, the historical chance might guide to or might say to all the others. So it's only four verses that we studied today, that they spoke about an arrest. We tried to see why these people were arrested, what they were preaching. What did the, the, their captors know about what they were preaching? And why all this was held? And why all this is described in this book? You may read these four verses and understand nothing. Unless you have the feedback from our fathers. You can read these four verses again and again and stick to them and make so many sermons that you can speak about these verses for hours. I don't have a the intention to speak to you for hours. So now I think it's the time for me to shut up and listen to your questions. <laughs> Questions. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes you have to ask yourself, why do you clap your hands? Now, any questions? Your eminence, for, for those who are beginners in the faith and are trying to uh, read the, the Holy Bible, um, do you have any suggestions on? Uh, where to start from uh, because we get a lot of young people that when they open the, the Bible they immediately go to the apocalypse, the revelation and I find that very dangerous so where would you recommend for a beginner, there are many beginners here tonight that it's easy. <laughs> it's easy you start reading the New Testament from the beginning the fathers that put the books of the New Testament in uh, 
this row, they knew exactly what they were doing. So you have to start uh, with the Gospel of Matthew, then uh, it's Mark or the Gospel. Mark. Yes, Mark. And then it's Lucas, and then it's John. When you find yourself reading the Gospel of John, uh, then you will understand nothing. And then you will be very pleased. Because if you try to understand, if you want to use your brain in order to understand the New Testament, then you have already failed. This book is not to be understood. This book is to be prayed, is to be experienced, and this book is uh, to be used in order to create a relationship with God. If you don't use this book in order to ask questions, in order to try to pray harder, in order to try to be with God more often or in a closer relationship, then you don't read it correctly. And in any case, the Arabs and the Jews open their books from the back. You know that. We the Greeks open our books and the, the Anglo Saxons open their books from this side. The Apocalypse is handed down at the end. Please do not start from the end, because the Apocalypse is a book that cannot be comprehended. Basil the Great, one of our greatest, greatest uh, fathers, interpreted everything, every, every single verse of this uh, New Testament. But when he reads the book of Ap Apocalypse, he stopped and said, well, I cannot understand. If Basil the Great, who was enlightened, who had the Holy Spirit himself, declared himself incapable of understanding and, and uh, interpreting the Apocalypse, who are we to proceed and try to understand it? And even worse, try to depict certain historical facts and say, oh, this is that. Oh, what it says, this is this happened, or this will go to happen. This will happen. It's crazy. The book of Apocalypse is not to be read in a historical environment. The meaning of the book of the Apocalypse is that many harsh things will happen. Many difficult things will happen. Many evil things will happen. The lives of the Christians won't be easy. Well, the life of everyday people is not easy. Certain things will happen that uh, may lead everyone to depression or uh, to hard feelings. Many people will lose their faith. That's what the Book of Apocalypse says. But at the end, Christ and all of these who have stand, who have stood with Him, all the ones that uh, believe in God and accept the message of Christ, all of these will be the winners. In the end. It's Jesus Christ that will come and judge this world and stop every evil and uh, start the kingdom of heaven with those who have stood uh, by him, who have stood the, the birth of the faith, who have stood, who have stood the, the, the ethics, the morals, what the church stands for. Any other questions from the floor? About anything? That means that either they didn't understand anything or they had slept while we stopped. <laughs> That's why no questions ever arise. Would you know if you fell asleep? Yep. Oh, you did? <laughs> no. 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 Okay, no. Um, so are you saying we should not read the Bible and we should have... No, I say that we should study the Bible. Study the Bible. If you want to, to read the Bible, read the newspaper, please. <laughs> but if you want to open this book, you have to study it. Yeah. To, study, to study it according to, to, to the teachings of our fathers. And even try to, well, even not read it by yourself. I used an example the other day when we had this uh, synaxis, this Council of the Priests of Australia. I explained uh, why we have the candles outside the church. You see, when we have the candle, it's put like this, so horizontally. It's a symbol that uh, the people that are, that when someone is outside the church, is fallen. When we enter the church, we pick up our candle and we do this. So we pick it up and we hold it vertically. When someone enters the church, he stands up. He 
stands to his feet with the word. His soul stands to its feet. And what do we do next? We go to the Manuali, the place where the, 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 the candles are lit, and we lit our candle. How do we lit it? We pick up some matches and we open it, we lit it by ourselves. No, we lit it by some other candles that are there before our candle. This is the tradition of the church. Every person has to be enlightened by the efforts of another person. We don't wait well go back for the boat to come and appear to us. That's why we have the priests in the church. That's why we have the spiritual fathers. That's why we, that's why we have the new ones that even if they are even if they are not priests, they have the blessing of the bishop to hold sermons in churches. So, in the Orthodox Church, we say that someone is enlightened to the faith by someone else. It's the way that uh, Jesus uh, ordered us to do. He, he picked up his disciples, and his disciples became apostles, and these apostles uh, formed the church and created everything that we have in the church. So, Jesus Christ asked from men to act and save other men. You need to be saved by someone else, not by yourself. You have to trust someone to teach you the faith. We, we do not accept the faith by ourselves. We need the spiritual father. We need someone else to teach us. That's why we hold these sessions here in the church, and we have servants, and we have uh, the liturgy, and all of these meetings that have to do with uh, the services, so pray. But we have it. But, uh, they also have to do with teaching, serving. It's important. You cannot light yourself up by your own. You have to be lit up by someone else. And when you lift the candle, then you have to be cautious how to put it among the other candles. Because if you put it in the wrong way, it will create chaos. It will melt, and sometimes it will burn too fast, or even cause a fire. So. Even if you're enlightened, you have to be very cautious, cautious how to use this light. We say that till the day of your death, even if you're a saint, you are not sure that you're going to, to, to be saved at the end. We have seen saints that in a minute they lost everything. Are you familiar with the, the climax of St. John? Do you know that? The ladder. The ladder. Uh, Saint John was an abbot at Sina and wrote uh, a book that the name of his book is The Ladder Climax. Climax. In his book, <coughs> he describes 33 virtues and how to obtain them. So every virtue is a step that follows to the other. It's like the ladder that you have to climb in order to reach the gate of paradise. When we uh, make pictures of this ladder because we put this ladder in the walls of the churches. Sometimes we demonstrate people that are at the highest levels of this ladder. We, we present them to fall. We have cases in which great saints lost their sanctity and fell. So you cannot be sure until the day of your death that uh, you're safe. The spiritual life is something that is very thin. You have to be precautious. You, have, you, you can never believe to yourself. It's the main uh, teaching of the Orthodox Church. Don't believe to yourself. Question yourself every step you make, every decision you make. And that's the best thing to do so as not to be selfish. And so as to be guided by someone that you can trust. Right? Anything else? There are no comments? Yeah. Have seen the pictures? That's not the pictures. Yeah. Um, Anything else? Yeah. I think that goes to growth what we say each week. Your eminence, because we always harp on the fact of having a spiritual father, a God, yeah. and how important that is. You need that other light 
to add to your light, to give you the light, to show you the way. Because it's dark, and so it's dark and we need light. But <laughs> let me mark something. We say spiritual father. Uh, we will we always go and look when we can follow. The biological way. Huh? Not always. It's uh, well, it's logical or it's accepted that sometimes it works. No? This world of sometimes prove the law between the father and son or father and daughter. No? It's the same with spiritual father. You have the right to disagree in order to, to get a better explanation. When Christ said, study the books, study what is written, that's what he meant. Do not accept easily what the other tells you. Try to, to think harder, to think deeper. Be hard to the one that speaks to you about Christ. And you're not hard to me at all. Why? <laughs> that means that you don't accept me as your spiritual father, and that's it. Uh, the truth. Your spiritual father is someone else. It's a special of Paris, it's your vision here. You have to be hard to them. Please be so. <laughs> <laughs> It's a great way to end it. Um, fathers, you got you guys, do you have any comments or questions for us? That's a good that piece. We'd like to thank you, Your Eminence, for uh, the, the time. We know your me. schedule is very busy here uh, in Australia, and you make time for our youth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we give a round of applause? His Eminence has brought a little gift for all of you. It's an icon of Saint Achilles, who is the patron saint of Larissa. He's going to receive his blessing and the gift, and then we're going to have a group photo over here where the stage is. And just to remember this beautiful spiritual night that we had with His Eminence from Larissa. Thank you. And I have to thank you for not laughing at my English. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And at the, yes, yes, and at the same time, well, I have to thank you for many things, among others that they were so patient with me, and uh, how much time do we speak? What's the time? What's the time now, Father? Tell me the truth. What? I'm really sorry that I consumed so much of your time. Uh, does one of their parents be angry? Do you know where you are? They stay here up to 11 o'clock. What? Ah. Yes, we're Greeks. Yes, we stay later. Yeah, I know. It's in our nature. All right, we stay. I'm going to do a present.